Welcome to the Behavior Grooves Podcast. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We interview interesting people in order to unlock insights into behavioral science and how we can apply them to work and life. Okay, Tim. So we typically talk about our sponsors here. But today, today, instead of sponsors, we're going to ask you, our listeners, to do something for us. We would love for you to forward this podcast on to just one of your friends, a friend that is cool and smart and that you think might find our witty banter and deep insight interesting. I don't know if people have that many friends. Even <laughs> even one friend that would enjoy our witty banter. <laughs> I don't know. It's because we're so witty. And that, that's that's it. That's all our listeners need to do. Just forward this on or another Behavioral Groups episode to a smart friend and asking them to give it a listen, as they may say in Australia. Good on you, mate. There you go. You got your Australian <laughs> accent going. Oh, man, I'm going to get such bad mail on that. Um, <laughs> sorry. No, uh, our no, apologies. No you, no, you won't. We don't get any, any mail. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> okay, this leads us t- into our episode today with Bree Williams, who resides and works in Australia. I've known Bree for a number of years, um, met her after reading a blog post she wrote, and I thought, we are from the same tribe. Australian? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, behavioral science. Oh, oh that tribe. That I'm tribe. sorry. I was yeah, going to yeah. say, I didn't know. I... <laughs> no, we, we actually met in the San Francisco airport a couple of years later, and Bree established uh, the first Australian consultancy specializing in the application of behavioral economics. Uh, she's been focusing on business and personal effectiveness since 2011 and has a broad range of clients. It's, it, her business is, is doing great. But she's also an author of multiple books on behavioral science, including uh, Behavioral Economics for Business. Her new one. Yeah, the new one, which is which is very good. The How of Habits and uh, our personal favorite, The Little Book of Behavioral Economics. The Little Book of Behavioral <laughs> Economics. Again, yeah. Yeah, that was, that, but that was, that was not an Australian <laughs> But we had a good conversation with her about a number of topics that, as our regular listeners might suspect, kind of went all over the place. Yes, we talked about her model of applying behavioral economics, a triangle approach of overcoming the three main barriers that she sees of apathy, paralysis, and anxiety, and how apathy relates to Danny Kahneman's System 1 and System 2 thinking, how paralysis is much like uh, choice overload, and anxiety is focused on loss aversion. Yeah, we also talked about priming with hotel passwords and toilet paper. Toilet paper? Is is this the... I, I, you know, I, I'm trying to think. I think we've had other conversations about toilet paper on this podcast, have we? Or, well, or is this a first? Lou Carbone introduced it to us, I that's, think. That's true. But, yeah, maybe we have. <laughs> anyway... Okay, toilet so paper. toilet paper. We're going to talk about how subtle changes can make a big difference. Um, and uh, the conversation expanded on relaying some information about her work and creating websites and actually some very interesting websites. And, Kurt, I know that you particularly enjoyed her music selection. I, I did. And it was one of the bands that I've talked about on the show in the past. But you're going to have to listen to the podcast to find out oh. more and which one. <laughs> Well, it was a fascinating conversation that we think you, our listeners, will enjoy. Again, if you haven't already paused this episode to share it, please do that right now. Share this with others. Write us a review. It really goes a long way in spreading the word about behavioral grooves. With that, please sit back and enjoy our captivating conversation with Bree Williams. Bree Williams, welcome to the Behavioral Grooves podcast. How are you today? I'm very well. It's great to be with you both. Good, 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 good. It's 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 morning in Australia. It is evening here in Minnesota. So you're bright and chipper, and and Tim and I are a little bit on the we end of the day. So <laughs> yes, listeners, please understand that that dichotomy that's going on. But we're excited. We are really excited to have you. So we'd like to start with uh, before we get into some real questions, uh, a little bit of a speed round. Uh, ready? I'm ready. Okay, bicycle or unicycle? Bicycle. Live life without a mobile phone or life without a laptop? Without mobile. Okay, <laughs> name one of your guilty pleasures. Uh, chocolate. Chocolate, mm. Mm. that's good. All right, travel. Do you like to travel with a set itinerary or no itinerary at all? 
Itinerary. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Tea. Oh, okay. Uh, would you rather be the biggest behavioral economics consultancy in Australia or the 20th biggest behavioral economics consultancy in the world? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, and we'll end our speed round. Well, okay, <laughs> we have to dive in on that. Tell us about why that, that's neither. Well, I have the philosophy. I started my business, People Patterns, about seven years ago, and it was really I want the business to serve me rather than me serve the business. So I've seen too many small business owners um, becoming uh, enslaved to the work, and that's really not what my interest is. And so in, in terms of scale, so if I was to become the biggest, uh, it, would, it would swamp, I think, the intellectual development of um, if what I'm doing. So perhaps if the question was, do I want to be the best behavioural consultancy in Australia? Absolutely. And why not? I, am, I already am. <laughs> no, that's a, no. Little <laughs> that's a little arrogant. No, it's, um, I'm just having some fun with it. But yeah, Bigger for me doesn't equal success. Okay, yeah. fair enough. So we met about seven years ago, if I re if I remember right. Is that is that fair in the San Francisco airport? I don't know that. Oh, it possibly was seven years ago. Do you know how we first connected, Tim? It was a, a blog I wrote. Do you remember it? It was called The Slapdown. Yeah. Oh, oh. And, and you said you pinned it on your wall and Dan Ariely liked it and all this sort of thing. And so we yeah. connected uh, via web a couple of times and yeah, <laughs> so began our friendship. That, uh, that's, isn't that great? And uh, we are absolutely, um, you know, of this cut from the same cloth, you know, in, the, in that regard, which I think is really cool. Um, but how long did it take you to develop your behavioral framework? I, I remember you got started, you came from accounting, right? And, and didn't you have like an accountancy background and yeah like like most people who end up um doing what we we do it probably wasn't a straightforward path so I studied I did a double degree of psychology and and accountancy which was a very odd combination at the time and possibly still is but <laughs> and I really did I didn't know how the points would fuse but they have uh delightfully so um, how did I get into behavioral economics or how did I start my consultancy or my behavioral framework? Oh, long, long path. But I did accountancy really as a starting point to get into business. I think finance skills are great fundamentals to underpin any sort of understanding of business. Psychology was always my natural interest in how people involve themselves in, uh, in life. And so my first five years, I was working in finance and then I moved into human resources. Mm -hmm. uh, I was with the Coca-Cola company. And then I moved um, into product management roles. The first being with Thomson Reuters in a, in a publishing capacity for human resource books. And the, um, the last was for the Yellow Pages, White Pages uh, brand in Australia. And so I was managing the phone directory which was actually more interesting than it sounds because in Australia, the, the phone directory was one of the only ones in the world to make money. Oh. So it was, it was about a $400 million uh, business on its own. And whilst I was there, I was a little disenfranchised with um, how, we were getting how we were getting information about our customer base. And it was the Christmas of 2008, I think. My brother gave me a book that changed my life. And the book was Predictably Irrational oh, by Dan Ariely. Oh, of course it was, yes, yes. And I, I, I thought, well, that's exactly what the fusion point that I've been looking for is how people in business can get answers about their customers in a new way. Because um, in my role in a product management sense, I was We'd commission a lot of focus groups. We'd have a lot of survey data, and yet it wouldn't ever translate into real behaviour in the marketplace. So there was a disconnect in what we were relying on for making decisions and and um, what people were actually doing. And behavioural economics for me was was the point that uh, filled that void. Yeah, and yet and yet you're not a big fan of of the, the part of behavioral economics that's really just a panoply of ideas and, and heuristics. and heuristics and biases, that, that didn't appeal to you. 
or, or, or you didn't, or, uh, well, you, you explained, but it didn't sound like that was functional for you. It wasn't, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So whilst I was still in my corporate role, I wanted to prove to myself that this field of behavioral economics that I've recently acquainted myself with could be applied to business because the the books as great as they are, so nudge and predictably irrational and, and the um, all of the extensions to those are written for a generalist or from an academic perspective for multiple industries, but they're not really written for business practitioners. And so when I was still in the corporate sector, I wrote a book called 22 Minutes to a Better Business. And that was really 18 common business issues. And I would take what behavioural biases and heuristics could be applied to each of those scenarios. So customer retention, staff motivation, um, how you invoice and how you price your products. But it was really just a little, um, it was a very short 40 page booklet. People can download it for free off my website. And I called it 22 Minutes to a Better Business because at the time, Two and a Half Men was very popular on television in Australia. You know, the Charlie Sheen yeah. sitcom? Yes. So my proposition, yes, everyone unfortunately remembers it. And I couldn't understand why it was so popular. But my proposition to my readers was stop watching, you know, a 22 minute sitcom and substitute it with a book where oh. you'll actually read something. So it was tw 22 minutes to a better business without the ads, you know, content for a sitcom is 22 minutes. So, but that for me proved that there's a gap again in how businesses are going about it because there was a connection point between all of these biases that are floating, all these principles and how do we ground them into what we do on a day-to-day -day uh, day -day basis in business? And this is a long-winded way of saying cut, to the chase, I, I left the corporate sector because I could see that there was, a, um, there was an opportunity for someone to do that translation between all of the science and what it means on a day-to-day -day business basis. And that's what my consultancy became. But as you were saying, Tim, having uh, behavioral economics is useless unless you can wrap your arms around all of it and say, well, how is it going to change what I'm doing? And that led me to developing my own framework because one of the challenges with behavioural economics as a, as a um, area of science is that there is no, as we know, no codification. There is no unified right. um, framework. And that means for people in business, uh, how can they use it? it? It becomes otherwise a laundry list of principles, but how do I write an email differently? How do I do my pricing differently you know the the there seemed to be another missing link which was uh, how does it help me change my life uh when i'm sitting down and doing something on a day-to-day -day basis yeah well so so tell us uh tell the listeners about your model <laughs> the model really starts with a very basic um statement around everything we do in business every day is about getting people from point a to point b so point A is what people are currently doing. So what your customers are currently doing. Point B is what you would like them to do. Now, usually in my experience, people jump straight to point B. We know what we want our customers to do. And by customers, they can also be internal customers, our stakeholders. We know what we want people to do, but we forget to ask what are they currently doing? And only by knowing what they're currently doing can you understand the magnitude of the change that's required. So the model starts with, Point A and point B. Sounds basic, but often it's skipped. From there, in order to get people from point A to point B, there are three points of resistance that we can anticipate. And this is the framework that I've developed around behavioral economics. So the first resistance that you're likely to encounter, I call it apathy. Okay. And this is based on system one and system two. So apathy, what do I mean by that? People are we are have lazy brains. We think very quickly, we think most of the time quite superficially. So if we're not engaging our customers, if they are apathetic, they can't be bothered, it's more effort than it's worth, they're not going to bother doing what we would like them to do. So apathy is the first barrier. The second is paralysis, that's paradox of choice. So this is where people might be interested in what you're suggesting, but they're getting overwhelmed by that decision. So our role there is really to clarify the choices, the options that we're presenting and put them on a path to resolution. And the third barrier, 
assuming now apathy is not a problem, so they're interested, paralysis isn't a problem, so they know what they need to do, is anxiety. And this is the principle of loss aversion. So what, why are they worried about proceeding? And now this can be as simple as I'm not going to press that button on a website because I don't know where it leads or I don't know what it does. And so that also inhibits behaviour. So apathy, paralysis, anxiety, those are the three barriers that prevent people from moving to, from point A to point B. Once you in, interrogate your behavioural challenge through those lenses, you can then use all of the other behavioural biases and heuristics to populate that, flesh it out, but also come up with solutions to, to get people to change their behaviour. So, oh, go ahead, Kurt. Oh, so, so when you're looking at that, at the process, do you, uh, how do you use that in your business? So are you going through and, and, and running uh, kind of an analysis around how that current, the, the point A is and where they are and, and the magnitude and, and how that applies to apathy, paralysis and anxiety? Is that, is that kind of the way? So if the business is looking at that, so help us understand that a little bit. Exactly. So a lot of the training work I do is teaching people about this model. So it's really getting them to pin down what is their behavioural objective. So what are they looking to do? Because um, often people rush to things like, oh, we need to educate people. Well, educating them might not change their behaviour. So what is the under, underpinning behavioural objective? So that's the training piece. If I'm doing an analysis myself, yes, I start from exactly that point. Uh, there are a couple of questions that uh, I ask before we get into the A to B. The first, the first is, who am I trying to influence? And then the second is, in what context? So who am I influencing? What context? So what's happening around them? Where are they? Uh, are there other people around them when we're trying to change their behaviour? And then I go into an analysis of the situation. So you can use this model. It's beautiful because it can scale. So I can use it when I'm looking at a smaller issue, like I'm trying to get people to um, engage with a newsletter, for instance. So I could look at it that way or a website. I've also been using it in larger scale issues, like how do you get whistleblowers to participate in a workplace? How, how do you get them to blow the whistle on divergent or unethical business practices. Um, how, how do we get people, we call it superannuation, but 401k, how do we get people to contribute more or participate more in their retirement savings? So the model can really scale and it can cut across any sort of industry and any sort of uh, organisation type, which, is, which I love because it just gives me so much opportunity across different industry sectors and I get to... The light globe goes off with so many people when they start to look at it through the prism of behavior change. Yeah, uh, well, and having a model helps uh, it helps us understand, right? Uh, and, and it's cool. I mean, I mean, you're drawing from really fundamental stuff. You're drawing from Kahneman and Tversky's work. From I, I assume that the, that the uh, paralysis part, that paradox of choice, comes from Sheena Yangar's work. And, you know, and, and their, um, their work is just fundamental to, to the basic understanding. As you said, the books are great for this generalist approach to the academia, but not so much for the application. Um, I'm going to, I want to ask you, what did you think of, of um, like David Halpern and uh, Alan Sampson's uh, models that came out of the UK Insights team, uh, uh, Mindscape and East? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in, I'm, I don't want you to, you know, smack them, you know, with how bad they are. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of East, actually, but uh, as, as, as a model, but I'm just wondering what, you know, uh, what you think about those. They came after your your model, but what, what, what do you think of those? You, you can smack them now. <laughs> just, you, know, you just want right some now. controversy on this podcast. I've seen it before. Yeah, look, I have my own, uh, I guess it's a, an acronym or a mnemonic that way. I call it influences. So I have, you know, each letter of influences stands for things like I means in, um, immediacy, for instance. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, N is for norms. So uh, it, it seems to be quite a common thing to create um, memory aids like that. And that's probably the more the mind space, um, how yeah. mind space works. So 
east is getting a little bit um, further towards, I think, active activation. Um, why I created my model, and just for listeners, my model is actually in the shape of a triangle. So the A is at the bottom left of the triangle, the B is at the bottom right of the triangle, and then you go through the, the three layers to give you just a, a sort of visual. And I chose the triangle because it means change. So it's the delta symbol of change. Right, perfect. But also it means that, you know, I wanted to convey the fact that you've got to go up the apex of the triangle. You've got to go through the barriers before you can then go down the, the slippery slide, the ease of going down towards the um, other side of the, the triangle. So what I was trying to devise in my um, model was a sense that this is active and it's also grounded in behaviour change. So always bringing it back to what's my A, what's my B, and not losing sight of that objective and having the model um, come, spring out of that objective, really. Uh, so I think as a framework goes, I think uh, where, my, where I've found a lot of application for mine is that it is, it's more active. So it's rather than a passive kind of sense of this is a laundry list which like mind space, it's like this is a laundry list of which principles you can use. I, I found it much more um, uh, active and it also helps people make decisions about what might be in play. So when I talk to clients, it's is apathy in play in this scenario, yes or no? Yeah. Um, if you've if apathy is not the issue, is paralysis the issue, yes or no? Is anxiety the issue? And they might find at different times in their project different layers play out yeah. so at, at, um, often when we're trying to engage our, um, our marketplace apathy is the big thing so how do we get people interested in, in our offer once we've got them interested say for instance on a home page on a website so apathy might be the big issue but once we start to show them the product the product range that we have paralysis might be the issue and so you can start to it, it's more active in that sort of way because it flows throughout the points at which you're trying to influence people's behavior because as you know in order to get people from point a to point b it's a series of micro changes that we're asking of people absolutely absolutely and and this is all about individual you're, you're not looking at it from a sociological perspective you're not look interested so much in big groups you you really you, you're really this model is focused on individuals right uh, actually no it, it can be used on individuals so for instance if i was engaging a stakeholder internally I could do this model for that individual. But no, I use this, uh, that's the other reason it can scale. I can look at, for instance, how do I get Australians under 34 to contribute more to their retirement savings? Point A is they're not contributing. Point B is I want them to contribute. What do I know about this segment? How do I engage them? So overcome apathy, overcome paralysis. How, how do I overcome anxiety? So you can use it both on an individual scale and a um, segment, segmented scale. Well, and, and, and what I meant was that ultimately what you're influencing is each individual. It, it's, oh, true, it's yes. Coming, coming back to each individual, yeah. Um, when uh, we were, we, you know, uh, in, in preparing for this, uh, there's, there's this, uh, you, you, you're sort of like a all hands, anything that is available in the world of psychology, behavioral sciences, you can just grab it right in. There was a there was a great uh, a lot of references to primes in uh, in, in one recent article on uh, where, where you gave the example of uh, the Wi-Fi password. The password itself is book now and save. Yeah, it, you know, which is just a it, you know it's just a, such a, a great prime. Do you is there anything that's off limits to you, or, or or do you feel like a you know like you're just going to just grab from whatever good ideas there are. Oh, I think so, Tim. It's um, I'm a little bower bird, and I think that's <laughs> that's how you kind of need to be. Uh, I'm always looking for real life applications or insights into behavioural approaches. Um, I write for Smart Company every week, so that forces me to really come up with ideas every week. It's quite a discipline, and that's why when I'm staying in a hotel and I find that they've sequenced their their um their mini bar list in a particular way, or you know, they've um, they've they've talked about towels in a way that's curious. Um, you know, I bite on those sorts of things, and they end up in a blog. 
it, it, it might as well. It, it, <laughs> That's right. Right. It, yeah. might, it might as well. Well, and it does bring insights. I, I, I look, um, Lou Carbone, who we saw speak at a, at a recent conference, wrote Clued In, and it, it, much of his entire work is on the folding of toilet paper uh, rolls in yeah. in hotels and the the impact that makes on your perception of the hotel and various different things and it's it's very yeah well and, and and the correlation between how fancy the fold is and how much you're paying for the room and and if there's wow. anybody for for listeners yeah. you can you can probably google Lou Carbone uh, clued in and then you can see all these pictures and some of the oh, just... folding of toilet paper. <laughs> is well beyond anything that any normal person would ever, ever think of doing. Not just your little nice uh, triangular area that says, yes, we cleaned the bathroom and look, we did this to, you know, and you go, oh, great. And, uh, they have you know, swans. And, That's uh, impressive. I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to look that up because I think one of the other struggles with behavioral economics is, you know, it can seem very conceptual, it can seem very esoteric. And so to bring it back to everyday experiences because I'm mainly talking with a business audience that are they're looking to to apply it so it's like well this is all around you people are trying to influence you all the time I have not looked at the toilet paper but here we go here's another example uh, yeah. they may not have in Australia I don't know yeah. I might be the first <laughs> I, it does does remind me of some research that I, I did write about on some um I think it was out of the States, but they were researching how people don't use good products. So in this time, for instance, if you, and they bought festive toilet paper into a gymnasium and they counted the sheets that people were using, whether they used the festive toilet paper or they used the plain toilet paper. And they found that people were less likely to, to use more of the festive toilet paper. And the principle of, you know, the research was pe people tend to save good products for later. Yep. Or they don't, they don't, because they think there's been more effort involved in its creation. And so there you go. That's some more toilet paper research for you to, uh, to yeah, throw well, into the I mix. I don't know if we've had so much toilet paper talk on <laughs> the, the podcast before. This is a first for us. So free... <laughs> Obviously, you've done a lot of really interesting work with your clients. Is there an interesting project that you've done that you can share with the listeners that you thought might kind of bring to light some of the behavioral economic principles or even just, you know, some fun, insightful things that people might find amusing? Oh, goodness. Um, I don't know if we always think of them as fun. Uh, I always... <laughs> I always, <laughs> I always find them interesting because um, when I'm working with clients, I'm kind of the one that's outside of them. So I don't have the, um, the minutia and the politicking that they probably have to go through. I, I, I've worked a lot in the um, private health insurance market um, and I'm working with clients through that. I'm really, uh, part of the work I do is behavioral coaching, which I enjoy because after a training process, um, I then do 45 minute phone conversations with people because what, I, what I've certainly noticed is you can excite people about behavioural economics, but it's then the translation into I, now I have to go back to my desk and, and work on work something through. So I enjoy that work. Uh, other projects, look at, I'm looking at my client list thinking, oh, they're just, I've worked in um, one that I found interesting because it's an industry I wouldn't normally have thought about is pest control. Okay. For instance, so this um, organization. Yeah, you, you've uh, got to, there's got to be a story here. Why would a pest control <laughs> company be interested in the application of behavioral economics? Well, and, and I'm just making a big assumption here. I've been to Australia twice, and you know, <laughs> before I've gone down there, I always read about the deadliest animals <laughs> in the world are all in Australia, and many of them are bugs. And so. No, we only tell people that so they stay away. <laughs> That's all. But you obviously slip. Kurt, so. uh, yeah, the, well, apparently you're not paying all that the, much the, attention the to the brown it. reef spider, whatever <laughs> it is. Anyway, keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. Why, why pest control business? Um, often in small business, they come to me because they want their website to be, uh, be more effective. So websites are really, and that's actually where a lot of my business started because 
websites are a microcosm of behavioural influence. You're yeah. trying to get people to change their behaviour, activating it through a website. Um, and unfortunately, most websites that are created aren't created with psychology as the backdrop. So it became a very tangible way of me to describing how you can use behavioural economics because you can see it and you can measure it. So why this pest control business were um, just wanting to their, their website to be more effective. And one of the issues they have is um, when people are purchasing a property, particularly in Australia, we have auctions and uh, they want people to commission a, a bug, uh, like a pest inspection before they buy the house. Wow. But you might not get the house. So why pay $500 for a pest inspection on a house that you may not end up winning at auction? And so part of the challenge was about giving people a reason to get the pest control and um, even if you don't, you know, buy the house ultimately. So that very much was in the anxiety space of the model. So yep. people weren't willing to spend money because they saw that as a loss without any sort of potential gain. So but, but that was about how, how we could recreate the website to support that behavior. And uh, okay, so what did you do? How, how, what, what, what was the intervention that you, that you created? Well, well, we recreated the website. So we changed how we engaged people and um, there were a whole lot of different techniques we, we applied. So from um, using social norms and credibility cues on the website to the value proposition that we created. Um, I can't remember what it was yet, but um, <laughs> it was about, oh, so the prop proposition, because their, their business name was Surety Property. So we, I, I played on that to say, you know, you want to be sure when you're buying a property and mm. so not leaving anything to doubt. So we used a lot of loss aversion through that exercise. Uh -huh. um, to and overcome that framing and, and uh, yeah and did their did their business just boom after that yes yes it, <laughs> it's done very it's done very well they've been very happy with it because it is um it, it's a challenging one people don't like spending money if they don't know it and and often any sort of insurance uh, so m most of my clients are in in grudge purchases space so you know working with banks on getting people to switch banks because no one can be bothered switching banks, um, retirement savings, health insurance, um, buying, you know, pest control, all of these things, there's a lot of inertia. So the A is very fixed. People don't want to change their behaviour and so it's very much about trying to displace, displace that. So most of the industries in Australia that seem to be more active in behavioural economics seem to be around those very inert grudge purchase um, spaces. Yeah. So they're fighting apathy, a, a, a lot of them, right? Yeah, yeah very much. Yeah. yeah. So Bree, I know you um, have done a lot of work on habits. You have a books, you know, talking about habits. If you had to give our listeners three um, hints about how they can improve or, or make their habits better, what would you do for three, three suggestions for our listeners? Yeah. Oh, well, they'll have to buy my book, Kurt, because oh, I've forgotten you. off the top of my head. No, but um, why I wrote the book. So the book is The How of Habits. I was reading a lot on habits because after what, knowing what I know about behavioural economics, I was at a health retreat, actually. And at the health retreat, it was great because you could watch everyone's behaviour un unfurling during the course of the week. And I feel like they've never felt before and life is good and then they start to get really scared about well what happens when I leave the gates and I go back to my right. normal life and so that then kicked off for me a real interest in habits so how do you support this behavior change ongoing um, so uh, but one of my frustrations with the books are on habits and um, you know willpower and all those sorts of things again whether they were they weren't uh, practical or they, they didn't support me so part of the process that I've developed is taking people beyond knowing for instance what a reward uh, what your trigger is what your routine is and what your reward is but really mapping that out into a plan that you can you can follow so that's a long-winded way of saying why I, I wrote the book my three tips um, is definitely make it easy so one of the things that I do is always so that I get up early in the morning and walk the dog, make sure that the clothes are right next to the bed so I don't have to rifle around in the, in the cupboard in the dark to try and talk myself into it. So 
no, this is the work of BJ Fogg, really minimising the efforts so that you don't have to have a great deal of motivation to do it. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to do around identity and I, I, I've been very interested in the, I've forgotten the researchers, but uh, those that said saying I, I don't versus I can't do something is, becomes very important. So I don't eat chocolate cake versus I can't eat chocolate cake. I can't put it puts you into a mode which is you're sacrificing and it's an unpleasant thing whereas I don't is more an identity uh, issue I'm just not someone who eats chocolate cake now I'm experimenting at the moment with veganism and so I've really noticed that my identity has really supported that so identifying myself as a vegan has clarified a lot of my decision making and I don't feel any sacrifice around what I'm not having because I've identified now as something else. So yeah. I think identity can be um, a big thing. The third tip now, what should I say as the third tip? The third, the third one, and I've just finished um, Gretchen Rubin's book on the four tendencies, yeah. which I, I'd resisted for a while because I thought, oh, we don't need another model of splitting people and it doesn't relate to any of the other big psychological um, structures. Yes. Rightly or wrongly, like Myers Briggs and, and those sorts of other dimensions. Anyway, I read it and I thought it was uh, very good because she does um, then help people I sort of understand their tendencies right. um, in, in relation to habits. Why I bring that up is that. For instance, in my book to a degree and often in the popular literature, literature, it says you should share your goals with other people so that they'll hold you accountable. Now, that doesn't always work. Right. And so I guess my third tip is for some people, sharing your goals might work, but don't think it will work necessarily for you. Not so, necessarily for everyone. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I've seen, uh, aside from the literature, in, in my own experience, I've seen uh, situations where, uh, in business, where sharing goals uh, is very positive and has a tremendous effect. And I've also seen situations where it really works against the, the efficacy of the goal itself. Um, and so, yeah, so we, you know, we have, I, 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 I mean, that's, that's going to be a, a mystery to unwrap. As far as I'm concerned, that's that's a, a problem that academia and researchers have not yet solved. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not, just, and I don't think it's just environmental. I think that it, it has something to do with specific uh, situations. I, I spent the last three years working on on goal setting um, with George Lowenstein and Sara Bargava, and one of the things that we're trying to tease out is uh, is by gender confidence and risk. And so, so how do men versus women view confidence versus men and women viewing risk? And then how does that influence the setting and achievement of their goals? Um, so, and that's, uh, that, that work hasn't been completed, but, but the big aha was, guess what? Um, men and women achieve goals at the same rate. However, they set goals at very different levels. Women tend to be significantly more conservative in the way that they set the goals, and yet that they're they're achieving at the same rate, of, of course, as men. So, um, okay, with I that. Think, oh, I was anyway. going to say, that I think that's a really interesting space. And I think the, the one of the principles in behavioral economics that causes, I think, most issues is social norms. Because, you know, the blanket statement is that we are influenced by what other people do. How we are influenced and by whom and how our uniqueness and need for individuality is um, is influenced through social norms is a really interesting area and I think by extension goals because goals aren't set usually in isolation to the social structures right. I think that's a really interesting area Tim yeah uh, we want to uh, we want to put you on the spot here now Bree we want to talk about music so uh, whether you like it or not yeah we'll stop <laughs> rolling your eyes um, but uh, you know, uh, I know that you're a huge music fan. You go to you go to concerts pretty much every night of the week. Right? <laughs> in, in my mind, Tim. In my mind. <laughs> so, uh, so if uh, so, for our listeners, who would Bree Williams recommend as as a really great uh, musician from Australia? 
you have put me on the spot. I don't go to concerts, Tim. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that. I think the last concert I went to was In Excess, would you believe? And, and you know, that was just when In Excess was starting, let and, alone... And, yeah, you were like, what, 12 years old? Right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So... Um, <laughs> I will say I've just, uh, I have now a Spotify subscription. So my music habits have changed because oh. I have it on all the time, but I have music that doesn't interfere with my work too much. And I think mm. music can really set a mood. And so I think, I mean, it's priming. It, it really does prime our mood and it, it really helps me in that. So one of my favourites, uh, some some hip, hippie type hippie Australians, are Angus and Julia Stone. Yes. <laughs> oh, you, you, <laughs> Honestly, one of Kurt's favourite favorite yes. bands. Yeah. Okay. Right. And then concert when they came to Minneapolis, uh, probably that would have been six months ago or so. So. Uh, by yeah. far one of, I think, the musicians uh, and just the storytelling. Yeah, yeah they're, they're fantastic. So, okay. But was there, was there someone else that you wanted us to refer to? Oh, it's a little bit random. I was in, um, in the city a couple of years ago. I was walking down um, one of the malls and there was a, a busker called Santos Bocelli. And he is a classical guitarist, and I picked up his CD, but I don't think you'd find him but, um, on, on uh, any sharing apps. But, you know, it's one of those serendipitous finds that, you know, you hear music that you love, and it's, yeah, one of my absolute favourites. And, and, and his name again is? It's Santos, and I'll, I'll not get his name right, so I might have to let you know, but it's Bocelli or something like that. Okay. B-O-C-C, yeah. 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 We'll make sure we get that from you and put yeah. it in the show notes. Yeah, we'd like to have that in the show notes. So, so right. Bree, it is always a pleasure to talk with you. It's um, it's it's good seeing you in the, in this case, and um, and thank you for uh, for joining us on the behavioral grooves. Thank you. Absolutely, pleasure. Keep grooving. <laughs> <laughs> we will. will. Thank you. Welcome to our grooving session, where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our Behavioral Grooves interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into my hairless head, and Tim, your fine mane of hair head. <laughs> Dude, don't look too closely. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Come relative to me, it is, it is uh, I don't know, some lion goddess of <laughs> hair that didn't you know, make any sense you know someone uh someone recently uh, asked I, I think it was of you if you were the deep baritone voice on <laughs> on the podcast and i don't know how, how did you respond to that i said no i'm the tinny high voiced <laughs> on the podcast and i go tim is our radio guy he's the he's the musician he has that nice resounding voice i have the tinny nasally thing going on so oh man i i'm you know even after all these years of recording i still have a hard time listening to my own voice i oh. i know i mean i'm I... used to it but that doesn't mean i like it <laughs> <laughs> okay we're, all right we're, we're grooving here um, all right kurt do you want to start do you want to you want to talk about uh, something that that it impacted you from our conversation with yeah Bree. so i i want to talk a little bit about her her model about removing those barriers and the three barriers that she sees the the component of apathy paralysis and anxiety yeah, so me too so let, 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 that's good that's a great start all right so i think um from that perspective if as i'm looking at that i think there's some really interesting components to that and it, and it relates to um some of the an interview we did with another person, um, Sarita Parikh, who talks about glide, which is removing some of these barriers. And so it's an interesting model. It goes back into um, Kurt Lewin's uh, component of change and how change happens about, you know, removing again, barriers to change as it's going on. That in of itself, I think is a key concept. And it's a concept that we often overlook. We think about nudges and how do we, how do we motivate people to move to that next thing? And how do we get people to do something by giving them an extrinsic reward or providing a challenge for them or other things to, to pull them when in fact, I think a lot of our work and particularly the application of this type of work is really about removing some of those barriers that get in our way. And I thought that was a really insightful component. Yeah. Uh, two, two other things struck me about her model. One is um, 
it, it wasn't a critical comment that she made about behavioral economics or any of the, the literature that's been created, aside from the fact that it's uh, they're all largely theoretical or, uh, as one of our colleagues has said, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's sort of a stump the chump kind of a thing, mm. right? It, I mean, they're really cute and clever and they're memorable, but what do you do with it? And Bree's model is very much focused on action. Yeah. It's very much focused on on what do you do with this? And she then she quickly corresponds that that triangular model to the habit loop, which uh, you know, was certainly influenced by B.J. Fogg. I know she's she's been a, a, a big fan of B.J. Fogg's work mm-hmm. um, in in years past, and uh, and that that habit loop is a great way of taking the very actionable stuff that's coming out of of that model, clearing the path for behavior change, and then actually putting it into practice. Yeah, I like the component where, again, uh, it's not just behavioral economics isn't just a list of heuristics and biases. Right. It, right. it becomes uh, trying to put it in some semblance of an order or a model and really bringing that to light about how do we apply these insights? How do we actually take these insights into work and life, which is what we try to do, and make them so that you can actually have a positive impact on what you are trying to achieve, making change in your life or achieving goals, whatever that would be. She's also a um, a complete opportunist when it comes for to looking for uh, opportunities for behavioral intervention. I mean, <laughs> okay, that sounds almost. Um... I well, I I just I, you know, she's writing uh, she's writing a piece every week. Yes. for Smart Company. Okay, and that forces her into a mode of keeping her eyes open. And so when we got to talking about toilet paper. <laughs> It's like she's no I mean she's paying attention to all this stuff the passwords in the in the hotels the you know all, all the tiny little subtleties that are at play influencing us every day so I would consider that being more of an observer a, a, a <laughs> okay you know, really good observer as Apolo- opposed to an right. opportunist but yes apologies to brief I agree for, about that I think there is a component about that because she's been focused on this for so long and, and needs to you know, write that article weekly that her brain is now just set to she's, to look for those types of she's primed. She is well she's highly attuned to it. And and I think that that, that does a great service to her clients mm-hmm. uh, and to our um, sort of our community to have to have people we have to be observing. We have we we need to be on the on the lookout for opportunities to to make changes. So how can we how how, how can our listeners, how can you and I, how can we become better observers? What what are some of the things that we could do to become better observers of the behavioral biases, heuristics, our own little you know quirks on how we do things, what can we do? It starts with paying attention. It starts with 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 thinking objectively about anything that we're doing. I'm sorry. What did you say? Yeah. I, I spaced <laughs> off there. <laughs> Oh, Kurt, start, Kurt, come back, come back. It starts with paying attention. Sorry, that's right. It's okay. Yeah. Help, help me understand. So how, how do we do that? So that, that's a great thing, but how, how does one start to pay attention more? I mean, well, well we, uh, I had a conversation with someone uh, last night about this, and we talked about it. We, we use heuristics in our, in our decision-making to ease the cognitive load on our brains, right? which is important because our brains aren't really – suited for handling a tremendous amount of system two processing. It's too hard. However, there are there are certain times in our lives when it's good to stop and actually do a little system two processing. Okay. There are times when I'm getting in the car and getting ready to, to drive, and I stop to think and I go, okay, what am I doing? Am I really paying attention to everything that's going to happen in the car? And just for that, that t- period of time that I'm in the car, I try to really focus and try to be aware on um, a cognitive level of what's going on. What are, the, what are the things that are around me? Not just to be a good driver, but what's actually happening? What, what is my brain processing? What am I thinking about? How are you feeling? How am I feeling? Uh, and, and then what are the decisions that I'm making? So that as I'm driving along, I'm not just you know, cursing at, at the asshole to my right that I'm trying to get off I'll, you know, uh, 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 an exit ramp, and he's blocking me. And so I'm yelling and screaming, but what is the situation that got me to the, that point? Mm. What is it that, how, why am I in, in the middle lane when I need to be in the lane getting ready to exit? 
So it's, it, it sounds to be a little bit like mindfulness and being practicing mindfulness as you're going through your day-to-day -day component. Yeah. But we get caught in the routines and the habits and the ease of system one thinking, like we said, right? And we need it. We do need that. But so how do we, how do we jumpstart ourselves so that we aren't in that perpetually, so that we actually can stop and think about what we're doing and really pay attention to those things? Is it, uh, we had talked with uh, Caroline Webb and she talks about the when then kind of component, yeah. right? Or an if then kind of situation. Uh, is it something like that? So every time you now get in the driver's seat that you consciously, so when I get behind the driver's wheel, I will consciously think about what I'm doing. Is it things like those? Are those elements or as what else? A, as, as a behavioral nudge that the, the, the trigger is getting in the car and putting our hands on the wheel. Okay. And then at that moment, we are... We're, we we uh, automatically, we don't automatically, but we, we cue ourselves, we trigger ourselves to go, okay, where am I? What am I doing? Let, I'm going to be mindful while, okay. I'm, while I'm driving. Or or when uh, when my wife uh, walks in the door. Right. You know, sh she's been at work all day. Things have been going on in her life. And as opposed to sort of a, a perfunctory, hey, how was, how was work? Actually pay attention. Be mindful for a moment. Actually look at her. How, you know, what's going on? And, and, and have a potentially meaningful conversation. Maybe not, but at least be open to having that meaningful conversation because of paying attention to the, the words and the, um, and the disposition and, the, and the, all that stuff that goes along with it. So that. again, it's, it's coming back to finding those triggers to help us make sure that we are putting the attention on whatever the situation is. It can be behind the wheel. It can be when your spouse comes through the door. It can be when you are working on something at work that really needs to have maybe a little bit more concentration. But Bree is doing this on a daily basis of just finding these yeah. things and being observant of, you know, I loved the component of her, you know, that the password for the hotel. Uh, you know, that and noticing that and understanding that. And so does that come just because she has been immersed in this and it becomes uh, kind of second nature to be looking at things in that? Is that part of this? Is it really just getting that next layer of, of insight? That's a good question. And I think that's a topic for another grooving session. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, well, what do you think? What do you think about that? I've, I've been blabbering. No, I on on the part where I think the being immersed in things, I, I think that does lend itself. It, it it it's that component of I don't know if it's the ten thousand hours thing that you know was written about by Gladwell and, yeah. and all of that. But I think there comes a time where where it's so. Uh, immediately available in your brain because you have had such a exposure to these things that your brain can then, and instead of processing that, it can be looking at these other aspects. And it's not making much sense here, but I think there is some component. And I, I don't have empirical research to back this up. It's just a it's a gut feel where I think that there is something to be said about becoming an expert in a field and that then opening up the the wider viewpoint of of what you can see and what actually gets into your filters or through your filters into um, making those connections as opposed to uh, a common bias of becoming an expert in a field and then narrowing you know you know because the opposite can happen right because oh, yeah. you can you can say well i'm an expert in this and everything that you're talking about i already know that that's not right Mm. You know, um, and I can't remember the name of that bias um, right now. Maybe it's just the it's the forgetting bias the, or I think. the expertise bias. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's right. It's it's coming into a greater knowledge and then being willing to acknowledge that there's a lot more. Right, and it's and being, being able. I think it. even with that, um, you know, small, very focused knowledge in in that arena, that opens up being able to see things. It's almost um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's to a degree, it's that old adage of, you know, if I have a hammer, then everything becomes a nail. Yeah. And you can look at it almost in that, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. There's a bad thing that everything becomes a nail and it, everything isn't a nail, but it also allows you to see nails that you might not have otherwise noticed. Well, there's that. That's, and so, that's exactly right. So that's it. So um, I want to ask you a, a musical question. Uh oh. Yeah, I know. I, this is this is completely unscripted. Yes, yeah. so, <laughs> well, it, it actually is. I should should have known it was coming. So, uh, what what music have you listened to in the last twenty four hours that that was just really nice for you? Hmm. It was just like, yeah, that was a that's a good track. Yeah. Oh, the last twenty four hours, I have to. You're you're putting me on the spot. I did. Because you listen to music. Virtually every day. Well, right. I listen to music virtually every night. Every right? night, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I use it right. as part of my sleep component. You know, sleep process. I had it on my Pandora, my Damien Rice uh, uh, channel. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, uh, f- remembering a specific song, I can't say, but the the Damien Rice channel is that more of the acoustic flavor of he's an incredibly talented songwriter oh my gosh he guitar is. player he and is he is great singer. yeah yeah so yeah. i got turned on to a new a, a new artist uh, just yesterday afternoon a woman by the name of pauline hare h e r r okay pauline is um, is out on the west coast of, of the us and uh, it's it's mostly edm it, it's it's uh, electronic you know, okay uh, dance music for the most part, EDM. Uh, that's a technical term for electronic dance music. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. EDM. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> but she she recorded a track with uh, Tasca Black that is really really fine, and I just want to I'll, I'll put a link in, uh, in it. But but she has a great sense of melody and rhythm, um, and uh, she's an emerging artist. And I just want to call people's attention to it. So I want to ask you a question about music. So. What the, the, we didn't talk about this. I know we didn't talk about this. This is, <laughs> this is how we roll. Do you use music to prime certain emotions? If you feel like you need to be hyped, do you have a certain go-to music for that? If you want to feel like you have to focus, is there a certain go-to music for that? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Kurt. Because uh, I'm, I'm, abs- of course, I'm familiar with it. I'm abundantly familiar with it. I have people, all people, many people in my life who are happy to talk about how they like to play. We are the champions before they go into a meeting, and 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 that sort of thing. And uh, it's an effective prime. When I've been involved in it, it has absolutely worked. I don't process music that way, though. I don't typically process music that way. For me. Those songs, the, the, the songs that, that come are actually responsive to what's going on in my hmm. life. So I'm, I'm getting We Are the Champions after. I, I, that's what's playing in my head. And by the way, I have a soundtrack in my head almost 24 hours a day. <laughs> it may sound crazy, but I am listening to music almost constantly. Yeah. In my head. In your head. In my not, head. Not through headphones no. or on the radio, but just in the background of your head. My brain is processing music a lot throughout the day. So when I'm talking to you, you have this musical background to the words that I'm saying? D- did you say something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, or are you just uh, listening to a soundtrack that is actually more <laughs> interesting than what I'm saying oh, to you? It, it's, it's just there. And... Uh, and so when I leave the meeting, that was really good. Uh, the presentation, that's when We Are the Champion starts playing for me. Interesting. It's not the, pro- I, I rarely, I'm, I know the experience and I've been a part of it uh, when other people have said, okay, we're going to listen to We Are the Champions before we do. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's effective. My MO is, my, the way my head works is that those songs play in a responsive way as opposed to a prospective way. Interesting. Well, well, I think with that, I think we can wrap this episode up. <laughs> I think we up. should. Yes. Um, but uh, again, thank you, listeners, for listening in. Uh, as always, uh, if you like this, leave a leave a nice rating on your pod service, whichever one you use, and share with a friend, please. Thank you. Thank you.